this is the second panel discussion um, uh, towards uh, a ban on all kinds of uh, conversion therapies, including ABA, especially uh, for uh, conversion therapies for autistic people. So I'm really great, uh, for, grateful for all the, the panelists who have joined us and the, the listeners. So we'll, uh, as usual, we'll record the session and um, make it available online so it becomes an educational resource. So maybe we'll just start with a quick round of uh, introductions. I'll just go through here through the list. So Ali, do you want to start? Hi, I'm Ali Hoffman. Um, for the last five years, I've been teaching as a neurodivergent teacher in a neurodiverse classroom. Um, it comes with a lot of its challenges, even socially, but it also, I don't know, the struggle, it intersects and it provides a lot of empathy. Um, so I've been using this learning experience. Um, I know the teacher word can be kind of triggering for my students. And in the last five years that I've been teaching, in three of those years, uh, a few students, actually, three different students have referred to me as a tree. So I guess I could reintroduce myself. I'm Allison and I'm my student's tree. Um, so I think trees provide a lot there. Um, but I continue to be an independent advocate and researcher um, outside of my labor identity but it is something I feel very passionate about. So I do include it in my introduction. Thanks. Um, Jake, do you wanna continue? Introduce yourself? Yes, I will go. Um, thanks. Um, I'm a um, trans academic in a social work department. Um, so I teach in the uh, School of Social Work at York University here in Toronto, in Canada. I'm non-autistic myself. I find, you know, I find more and more that I share important things with autistic people. Um, I guess I, I want to start by just saying how deeply impressed I am by autistic activists um, like yourselves and others. Um, I learned so much um, from the work that uh, many of you are doing and you have my respect. I think, um, I think my main contribution uh, and maybe will be just to connect us to struggles to end uh, trans conversion therapies, um, which I was, it's a, a struggle that I was very involved in. Uh, here in Ontario, which is a province in Canada that I live in, um, and was involved in the, the sort of legislative process to have that banned. And I have sort of written about that in connection um, to ABA and to uh, to you know my hope that we that we see a ban on ABA um, in our lifetime. We're farther behind here in Canada, so I'm saying in our lifetime. I think you are uh, closer to that, and that's really really exciting. So thank you. I'm I'm delighted to be here. Oh. Thank you, Jake. Uh, I think it's uh, you, you've done amazing work, uh, and I, I'm looking forward to ongoing collaboration uh, on this particular topic. So, uh, Tara, um, if your connection works, perhaps introduce yourself. Sure. Maybe somebody can give me like a a signal if my connection cuts because uh, I'm out of town. <laughs> Um, my name's Tara, and I am the CEO of Neuroclastic. We are a nonprofit org and a publication. We have over 400 autistic contributors and an all autistic board. And um, we we focus a lot on on ABA. Maybe a quarter of our thousand, approximately 1,000 articles are, are centered on behaviorism. I used to be a teacher for 14 years. I taught English and um, I was a trauma counselor after that. And uh, while I was a teacher, I was our school district's anti-bullying coordinator. And so I feel that that's all relevant experience. Um, but very briefly, my, my last normal job <laughs> was uh, as an RBT, that is a registered behavior technician uh, in ABA. I didn't know what it was at the time. Um, and I took the job, I was only there for a month. And that was enough to know that uh, this is something that I'll spend my life trying to dismantle. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself? 
Sure. <clears throat> um, my name is Sarah Salvaggi Hernandez, and I am on the advisory board of Neuroplastic, um, the wonderful organization which uh, Tara referenced. I am autistic. Um, I'm deaf. I am fourth generation indigenous Penobscot from Maine. Um, I was the first openly elected or openly autistic person elected to government in the United States. And I also run a social media site called the Autistic OT. Um, but professionally, where uh, a lot of my work lies um, is pediatric mental health. And so I do a lot of identity development work, um, but I've also worked in patient and in community uh, settings and really to bring out the importance of um, being able to do what you want to do in order to figure out who your identity is. Um, and that kind of goes against what ABA is. Um, I have worked with ABA in the field. I have taught with ABA. Um, and uh, as a mental health practitioner, I have serious concerns. Um, so I have also dedicated my life to uh, joining Tara and all the amazing advocates out there who are working to dismantle the system um, because that's the only option. Excellent. Oh, mm -hmm. thanks very much. Um, so I think oh, oh, on myself, perhaps uh, my name is Jörn. Um, a few years ago, I started this website called uh, Autistic Collaboration that's since evolved into the Autistic Collaboration Trust. The whole thrust of uh, this uh, website and the thrust is really to uh, catalyze uh, autistic collaboration and uh, neurodivergent collaboration. So that takes on the form of uh, long-term projects, uh, initiatives, and even uh, autistic organizations, uh, what I, I refer to as neurodiventures. And um, so I see this entire um, initiative here. It's a wonderful autistic collaboration project. So thank you very much. And so let's get into the, the questions that we've got. Uh, perhaps we can pick up where we left off uh, in the first panel. So um, I'm going to read the, the question here. So the first panel discussion highlighted the need for adapting education systems to the reality of new diversity and to the intrinsic motivations that drive autistic ways of learning so that parents are less compelled to find ways to normalize their children. What would learning environments that are optimized for the needs of autistic and otherwise neurodivergent children look like? How would neuronormative children learn and develop in such inclusive environments? Okay. Law is open. Anyone wants to start? I'll take that. <laughs> I'll start. Mm -hmm. um, so it, we, uh, one thing that I want to emphasize uh, always, not, not just in this panel, is the value of uh, encouraging self-determination. And this is, uh, something that most children have built into society for them uh, but society does not seem to value uh, self-determination when it comes to children with disabilities and especially autistic children and the the whole foundation of uh, applied behavior analysis is to remove access to self-determination for um, autistic children. And so what, uh, what a truly inclusive, and I, I call it neuro-inclusive classroom, how that would look would be a classroom that centers protest from children. We want our kids to be able to say, to self-advocate and to say, this does not work for me. And we want to accommodate that. We don't ask our children, what do you need ever? We tell them what they're going to do and expect them to do it in the way that we tell them they should. Uh, for most children, 
this is not optimal, but it works to a degree because the steps that we have planned, the, the things that we know about how kids learn is not all kids. It is most kids. And so, you know, when we say things like, um, we've totally thrown out rote memorization, uh, 100%. But that is how a lot of children learn language, a lot of autistic children and otherwise disabled children. Um, and it's not that we should only <laughs> do anything. We should do lots of things. We should tell kids it's okay that you don't, that one learning style is not optimal for you. This is why we're going to teach this with all of these different modalities. It, it totally is possible to run a classroom that way. I've done it for 14 years and it was very effective. And so, you know, a neuro-inclusive classroom is a classroom where we start at the beginning of the year telling children that, you all learn differently. Here are optimal ways, uh, or here are several ways. We're going to discover what ways work best for each of you. And then we're going to try and accommodate that. Some children need to move to learn. So we have some children in seats that have a bouncy ball in the middle. And um, if some kids need to stand up and they need to shake their hands and they need to walk around the back of the room, that's okay. We will learn how to accommodate your learning style and we'll work on that together. That is what a neuro-inclusive classroom would look like. Thank you. I, I can um, just continue forward with that a little bit. Tara was talking about uh, self-determination and as part of developing identity, another um, important cornerstone is what's called self-actualization, where self-actualization is when you understand yourself and you understand the way that your body works and your body moves and your body takes in information. Um, one of my other specialties is sensory or sensory processing, excuse me. Um, and that is so fundamental for people, especially neurodivergent people who are more sensitive with sensory to understand what that um, information, whether it's coming from the physical environment, whether it's coming from uh, the expectations of a task, how that does that come into you and affect your body? Um, and so I do a lot of work around first validating that and also giving people the tools to realize who they are, what they like, what they don't like. And my specific concern with ABA and any compliance-based program is that it grooms out those opportunities for self-actualization. And in fact, um, the individual experiences something called identity foreclosure, um, which we know in the literature, again, anxiety, depression, like trauma, um, identity foreclosure occurs when somebody else has determined your identity for you. And um, in any type of conversion therapy, that is the goal is to turn somebody else into the version they want. Um, and we also know that, you know, so we're talking about this from a pediatric standpoint of identity development, but if you look at the lived experiences of autistic adults who have gone through some type of, whether it was conversion um, therapy itself, um, those of us like myself who grew up queer in a religious environment, um, people who grew up in very fundamentalist or very strict families, we know what that's like to have those uh, demands placed on us so that we cannot show our authentic self. Um, and it, we know from the literature and from the experience of autistic adults that what ends up happening is a lot of mental unwellness, not because we're autistic, um, but because of the disconnect and the dysregulation of living in society that doesn't want us. Um, and so one of the things that, um, yeah, ABA is notorious for is grooming away those unwanted behaviors. Well, I want them 
because behavior is communication. And how um, are we going to learn ourselves and be self-actualized so that we can self-determine, so that we can self-advocate uh, without this information? So any, any place that doesn't allow um, rebellion, uh, I, I don't like this, it hurts. I don't wanna be, I can't be who I am. I can't move the way I wanna do. Um, yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, Ali, what about uh, your experiences and, and thoughts on this topic? There's so many things that I want to echo and also support, with, like the self-determination and, you know, centering the protest. How else do you teach self-advocacy or how would you claim to teach self-advocacy and then not encourage the protest, not encourage no, not encourage this is where I'm uncomfortable, right? because it's not about our kids fitting in, right? It's about us fitting in around them, right? I don't want these like shaved off people trying to fit in to my classroom. That's not my classroom. I think that a neuro-inclusive, I love that word, um, classroom, you know, it's gonna dismantle power dynamics, right? Um, my kids and I are gonna collaborate right? Supporting needs isn't speaking for what you think they need, right? I'm teaching self-advocacy. So supporting their needs means consensually collaborating, right? Consensually challenging their potential and encouraging their strengths, kind of in this like simultaneous balance, because you have a lot of students and I want to speak and I, I, I know that we're all probably familiar with terms like trauma informed and things like that. But it's really weird and hard and sad to have a first grader come into class who's already totally traumatized by the classroom. Like, that's why when I introduce children to this classroom, I tell them that, you know, this is a, I, I don't need to tell them, they'll figure it out. It's a safe place with an even safer place to hide. I think a neuro inclusive classroom has a place to hide. Um, we've called it the nook, we've called it the fort. But as a classroom, we've worked together and we've designed a safe place to run to. And for students that I think, and this is where we kind of draw in the juxtaposition of the problematic situation with ABA, is that we know ABA addresses behavior as like a function of either getting something or escaping something. And we know it's so much more than that, right? But when you look at it like that, you're limiting A, getting what you need, and B, getting out of what's uncomfortable. So like, I know it's weird sometimes, and I know other teachers have looked at me funny, but I have let my students run out of the classroom because not only is it a safe place with a safe place to hide, but it's a place you can leave like when it's too much because that happens. You've got different sensory profiles in like in mass, right? And so I'm, I'm, I'm just an associate teacher. I don't have the letters after my name but I have great conversations with the teachers I work with. And something I try to remind them a lot is like, you don't have a classroom, you have a classroom of like this many different brains, this many different experiences, this many different needs. And that means addressing ourselves, right? So a neuro-inclusive classroom has teachers that have confronted the shadow. A neuro-inclusive classroom has teachers who kind of address their own metacognition and cognitive dissonance, right? I'm gonna look at my black and white thinking. I'm gonna look at my rote behavior, my rote reactions, my rigidity of thinking about how students should act in a really uncomfortable chair, right? <laughs> it means looking at the classroom as an experience, right? Here's a sensory experience. I might have a kid who's distracted, who looks bad, but he's just sitting under the AC, easy. That's because kids do well if they can. And a teacher who confronts themselves confronts their philosophy because there's a lot of teachers who think kids do well if they want. And that's kind of weird. That puts me in an uncomfortable situation. That means I'm the person who has to make them want things. No, 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 no. And that's weird because that's something that ABA does. They try to motivate kids into wanting to act a certain way, right? And so I think to kind of close this up, a neuro-inclusive classroom is also going to take a look at what learning looks like, because learning looks different for everybody. The experience is different. Learning looks different. And as a teacher, we need to consider those things. How does this identity of this kid incorporate into their learning style? How do they do well? 
not because I made them want to with a Skittle, right? Because they could, because they were in a comfortable chair with a trampoline in the middle, right? Because they were on the floor, because they were able to pace around the classroom, because I knew that I had to lower my voice for this particular student, right? It just takes thinking about those things. It takes empathy. And I think that radical empathy requires vivid imagination. Um, and I think that's why neurodivergent teachers do well as well when they can. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Oh, brilliant. I think, yeah, we've heard excellent um, points here. Um, and maybe I just uh, fill in here to um, articulate a few things that emerged from the last panel and also my, my own thoughts. Um, one way I describe autistic ways of learning uh, in particular with children is that uh, in many ways, the, the dominant direction of social learning is reversed. So it's that parents and educators, um, if they're dealing with autistic children, they learn, they're the primary learners. They learn from the child. Uh, about the specific intrinsic motivations. Um, they learn about the, what the child is discovering. And, and since every child has their own, well, cognitive profile, um, it, yeah, there's some really, really valuable things to be learned. And, and once you realize that uh, the learning is this bi-directional process and with autistic children, I would argue there is so much that the teacher or the educator or the carer needs to absorb and learn that that makes the a fundamental um, difference. Um, one uh, nice thing that was mentioned by, by Laura leading up to the, the first panel was the um, something that uh, I think is is the intuitive technique in which autistic parents engage with autistic children. Um, but in the UK, they use it in an educational setting. It's known as the, the low ar arousal approach. Uh, I don't know whether you've heard about that. Um, it's very interesting. And for me, it's just, well, that's how you deal with, uh, certainly with autistic children. And I would deal with like that with, with any child. It's, well, start with yourself. Uh, are you in a stressed state or not, right? So introspect and make sure that you're in a calm state, that you don't project uh, stress and um, then look at the environment. Is the environment uh, calm, not overstimulating? Um, and it's in this environment that you can then start engaging. And it's, I would then start by, uh, yeah, looking at what are the intrinsic motivations? What do these children actually care about? Uh, what would they like to learn? So, and this gets to what in the low arousal approach is, is they talk about personalization, right? So, and so it's to sum up, it's a low stress, uh, non-overwhelming environment, and then personalizing it, individualizing it based on the intrinsic motivations. And I think everything that you've just said here in your uh, synopsis of experiences is consistent with that. And now I'm really keen to hear from, from Jake, from your trans perspective, um, how you experience this or what your thoughts are, because I imagine that trans children will also be subjected to extreme pressures in, in typical environments. I think I think they are. There are some there are some important differences too. But I am um, I was just making a couple of notes while the other panelists were were uh, speaking. That was great. I loved hearing um, what all of you had to say. I, I don't work in um, children's or youth. You know the children's or youth education system. I, I teach at the university level, so I like I would defer to autistic people who've experienced schooling, which is all of them, um, and and teachers who work in that system. Um, but someone that I really appreciate is Nick Walker, who some you know you might know is a non-binary autistic um, academic in in California. And Nick um, asks, you know, why do we call it education for non-autistic children, but for autistic children we call it treatment? Like why? Why that distinction? Why why do we call it raising a child when the child is non-autistic? And we call it again, we call it treatment with, mm -hmm. with autistic children. Um, what what I've learned from you know autistic people in my life is uh, that a decent education would uh, you know have to value autistic ways of being, but would also 
have to stop overvaluing non-autistic ways of being. Um, stop overvaluing them, stop considering them to be the markers of the things, you know, health and well-being and the things that they are just not markers of. Um, uh, Robin Rossigno is, I think I'm pronouncing her name right, is an autistic um, academic. Again, she works in education and, and she has an article, I think it was in 2020, came out last year, and she's writing about the, the degree to which, I can put all these links, by the way, I kind of tried to collect the links to things I was going to mention, so I can put them in the chat. And she wrote about the degree to which ABA is embedded in the education system and how dangerous that is, um, but also how the concept of like problem behaviors, like what is a problem, keeps expanding. Like it keeps expanding to include more and more things that are problem behaviors and allows, you know, more and more ABA targeting of, of, of autistic children. And then also allows the really egregiously harmful practices. I think that subtle ABA is also harmful, but the really egregiously harmful practices, which is things like physical restraint. Um, I think also um, that I think that, you know, one of the ter words that I hear uh, again, I don't work in education per se, or not children's education. But one of the one of the words that I that I hear used a lot is inclusion, and um, you know I'm in favor of inclusion as much as as everyone else is. But I guess I just wanted to note that I think that words like inclusion, um, uh, general terms like that, can't do the work that we need um, to do here um, because it don't it doesn't get to the heart of the problem, um, or the problem it doesn't get to the heart of the problem with ABA. I think, which is that autistic children are not exactly being excluded in schools. Of course, they are excluded in many ways, and I. I don't doubt that on the playground in many settings, um, but exclusion is actually not what ABA does. It does the opposite. It's a, it's a, um, I've written about this with trans kids in terms of, it's mm -hmm. a very, very detailed, very dangerous form of inclusion in the sense that it is, yes. bringing, it, it brings them closer. It is not a pushing out. Um, it's a bringing them in. Um, they're under surveillance. They're under surveillance for 40 hours a week in some cases, in the case of IBI. Um, and it's, it's, it's observing them very, very carefully, documenting everything they do. It's insidious. Um, it studies them so closely and so carefully and then uses that knowledge against them, you know, like uses the knowledge yes. that is gained of them against them. And that is just not an example of exclusion. And so therefore the, the term exclusion, as, as, as much as I'm in favor of it, it doesn't, again, it doesn't do the work that we need. It doesn't take mm -hmm. us where we need to go. Um, and lastly, I would just add that the, the um, you know, I think understanding the power relations involved in ABA, it helps to also understand the ABA practitioners themselves are also groomed. They are groomed there. They themselves are subject to surveillance by their superiors, by their, you know, trainers or their supervisors, um, as our parents, as our teachers, you know, that there's sort of a chain, a chain um, of a, a hierarchy. Um, and ultimately the child is on the bottom of that hierarchy, but ABI practitioners are not on the top of the hierarchy, you know, so they are, they are, they are in there and they are also being observed. Um, and that that's part of the power relations of, I have to change this child because I have to report back on whether I've changed this child because someone's watching me too, you know? So I think that also those are, those are important dynamics. Maybe I'll just put a little link to, um, an article, Julia Grusin Woods is someone in, in mm -hmm. an academic in Toronto who's done some work with this. I'll just put a little link there in case it's helpful. Mm -hmm. oh. Thank you very much. And I think this ties in what we just heard earlier about the need for safe places for autistic children and autistic people in general, um, uh, because uh, social settings are not, or environments are not always safe for us. and. Uh, often these safe places are simply not, not there. Um, and it's also interesting that uh, yeah, even you, you observe these, these social power dynamics. I think autistic people and autistic children are highly aware of those. And one way also to describe autistic cognition is that we've got, um, well, we are hypersensitive to these uh, power gradients. I mean, because we don't accept arbitrary authority. We don't uh, just uh, execute demands. This is not our way of being. Um, we want to show you what we discover and then ask questions and then uh, would uh, like assistance maybe. So this is a very different mode. And that has implication for inclusion, not only in education settings. So I just, uh, uh, I mean, I work with 
organizations, with companies where um, there are many undercover autistic people. And uh, so there in the workplace, I see these social power dynamics all the time. And uh, if we want to create healthy work environments for autistic people, these work environments need to be organized radically different. And uh, we can never be included uh, if we're just the, the one autist uh, in a whole team or organization of non-autistic people. We need the ability to have our own team, our own autonomy where we don't have these social power gradients because this is not our way of being. And that's, I think, very, very hard to understand for, for people who are indoctrinated in, in Western industrialized culture. I was wondering if I could reply to that because I've been so, it's been so interesting. I think naturally observant individuals keep observing and um, it, it has been curious to watch the leader, right, of a classroom implement or attempt to implement a power dynamic to a community or population that's just like, right and then and then label it defiance when really it's, it's not that at all it's just there's not and why why to what end um and so i have i have found myself like when you say when teachers train other teachers and say like oh well you know you should get on their level i think i think i think it's interesting to, to me to consider how analytic or you know, a neurotypical teacher might be so literal about that and like be like, okay, and like get down on their level. And I'm like, you need to look through their lens, right? Like we need to consider what the situation is. There's not the projection of defiance, the projection of a power struggle that's non-existent. And I think that, um, I know there's another question on, on here about, um, specialists who don't stop practices and things like that. Um, and so I don't want to lead too far into that. But I did just want to reflect on that. I think, I think being an observer, you notice that a leader, let's say a neurotypical teacher is trying to teach to the wrong audience, right? And you just kind of sit back and you're like, this isn't, there's a disconnect here, it does not compute. Um, and it's, it's difficult for me sometimes to make these observations in my everyday and then struggle to communicate them um, in a way that also doesn't come off defiant or insulting or with an ulterior motive. Um, and so when I sit back and think I wanna dismantle these power structures, I definitely picture there's a group of people that don't see them at all. Um, and those are the ones I'm dismantling this for, right? Those are the ones that I'm taking a look at these scaffolds and coming in with my wrench. Um, my gentle wrench. <laughs> yes, where you where you have a wrench, I I tend to be more a, a battering ram. <laughs> that's um, it that's, serves that's been my nickname. <laughs> yeah, I mean some sometimes uh, that that's been my nickname from time to time. I, I guess it fits, but. Um, I think one thing I want to bring up is is oppositional defiant disorder and people are now um, you know there's PDA the pathological demand avoidance for autistic kids uh, or adults that a lot of our community has embraced uh, because they find so much uh, they relate but I think I call PDA power differential aversion mm -hmm. and that um that that acronym fits and Hold i on. love it that you know that is exactly the way that i parent uh that is the way that i that i approach teaching um not because i knew but because i'm wired that way i never enjoyed i never felt uh power differentials I, they don't make any sense, you know, they, they fuel all, all inequity, um, that white supremacy and homophobia, just any bigotry, uh, elitism and classism. 
And so I just want to say that, uh, you know, when I started, I said uh, a neuro-inclusive class empowers children to protest. And I think that we should, we should love that about children. We should feel proud when we see them self-advocating and we allow a lot of children to self-advocate. We allow a lot of children to ask for consent, but we do not give autistic children that kind of uh, access to, to live and to self-advocate. Uh, so I just feel like that is, and I think that saying that to teachers, to most teachers feels radical. They would say, you know, this classroom will be bedlam. It will be in, it will be crazy. We won't be able to manage behaviors. And I think that the opposite is actually true. When you allow your children to be invested in their own learning, they, they love to. Children are natural scholars, especially autistic kids. They love to learn. We just, uh, we just have to stop forcing it on them. Yeah, it, it's interesting that the language, I mean, these power dynamics are built into the language we use and they are built into the entire education system and, and the school system. So you, 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 you know, you notice the word behavior management. I mean, behavior doesn't, I don't consider behavior something to be, be managed. And um, it's, uh, yeah, I think if you're not autistic, it's very easy to ignore all these cues that our environment provides us with all these power dynamics. And um, in the workplace, uh, there's of course then another dynamic. I mean, there's uh, often autistic people are at the sort of uh, receiving end of the power dynamics, but there's also the weird uh, opposite end where, you know, if you're expected to manage people, right? Uh, then, um, well, autistic people uh, take to that very differently. I mean, because, they want to do this without pie dynamics. And it's sort of, well, actually it works, you know, at the level of, uh, I've always wondered in the past, I think this is why uh, during the few years where I was employed uh, more than 20 years ago, um, I always mysteriously ended up in these um, team leader roles. And I think it has got to do with the fact that of real authority, right? So, and somehow uh, I was someone who could catalyze collaboration. And, um, and this doesn't appeal, if you're a person like this, then uh, well, these career ladder climbing systems, they're just toxic, they are deadly in the end. And, and I think that's what we suffer in the workplace. And which is why I think we need to create radically different workplaces for autistic people. Just getting us jobs in corporations actually kills us. I think a lot about these systems um, and how we as individuals are products of these failed states, right? Um, so when I talk about, you know, teachers needing to do that shadow work, you know, we need to look at how the failed state is within me, right? Um, I can address it and I can dismantle it and then bring my work outward, right? Or like not noticing the certain cues in a classroom. I, I heard you say, you know, maybe it's easier if you're not autistic to ignore certain cues in the classroom. It's also kind of like, well, we're also looking for the systems in place to be the signs to guide our way. And we're not looking for neurodivergent cues. We're not looking for different languages. We're not even looking for, what are we looking for when we walk into a classroom, when we walk into a workplace, when we look at workers, right? And, and why, when we walk into a classroom, do we look at our children as just simply future workers? Um, I think there's a lot of mislabeling that happens, not only with oppositional defiance and things like that, but hello, we have an individual putting like an authority on an individual who can't absorb that sense, right? And then we're mislabeling it defiance. Now we have a diagnosed person on just some pipeline to shame, you know? Um, 
And in the same way, I feel that there are teachers who try to address things. And I feel like there are even schools and education that try to address things and be like, okay, so you have this gift, but you have this lagging skill, right? But even then it's called a lagging skill, a skill for what? Working, right? And so sometimes we look at these behaviors and we're like, oh, well, it's not their fault. It's not defiance. It's just a lagging skill. And I have sometimes have to call and a light and I don't have the answer here. And I'm like, why are we calling it even a lagging skill? Isn't this individual human just lacking support in a specific area? Yes. Why yeah. are we talking about skills? <laughs> well, it's, uh, we have to realize that every human depends on other people in ways, in unique ways. Uh, so we're not co standardized cogs in the machine. And I think uh, the construction of our society uh, gives us a simplistic model for the complexity of the support network or the relationships around us. We need trusted relationships. Uh, and, every, and, and if we have those, then those other people around us, if we trust them, that means they understand us and they can support us in a, in, in a way that uh, uh, makes sense to us. And if we uh, don't have these relationships, uh, well, then we, we, we suffer. And uh, this complexity is ignored in, in the uh, ideology that, uh, well, our, our education uh, system tries to, to teach us. Um, and it would be time, I think, for, well, the education system to, to step up and to step out of the industrialized uh, factory model. Uh, it's, I mean, it's ironic uh, that uh, people are lamenting that um, people who leave the education system seem to have lost their sense of creativity. Well, I mean, what we've just been discussing is all the ways in which you're systematically uh, bred out of people, right? So it's the system. <laughs> um, I'm conscious of time. So we stuck with the first question so far. Um, what I would like to do if possible is, uh, I think that second question is also really important. And that's a question about allies. So, in our campaigns to ban conversion therapies in New Zealand and globally, which organizations and interest groups are suitable allies? So I've got a few thoughts on this that I might just throw into the room and then you can add to this and uh, we'll see where it goes. So I've jotted down a few things here. Um, one is a, another, um, it's, it's, a, it's a online, network organization called the Design Justice Network. Uh, so I joined them last year. They started out in the US and they are um, expanding globally. So they exist now also, uh, yeah. I'm basically trying to, to expand that network here in, in our geography, so uh, New Zealand, Australia. Um, and in that organization, well, very quickly I, I bump into all kinds of neurodivergent people and autistic people there. So, uh, and there is acute, because they're concerned about social justice, it's a very interesting organization to collaborate with. So I'll uh, link this in the uh, minutes, basically. Uh, I think this would be a way for us to connect with people who uh, in many cases, well, they are, the diversion people there as well, but it connects us with the wider world. Um, the other group that I deal with on a regular basis, and we don't even mention uh, autism and related topics, is all the undercover autistic people who work in healthcare and, and various uh, technology settings and so forth. And uh, well, they tend to approach me uh, in outside work channels. Uh, and I think it's an untapped resource that is easily overlooked because, you know, if one in 30 people is autistic, well, you'll find them everywhere. And in some uh, sectors, they, the proportion is even higher. Uh, so in, in healthcare or um, technology, I think it's perhaps more than, more like one in 10 people. Um, the, I, I think organizations, national organizations that represent disabled people can be good allies. Um, and then, uh, 
sort of, uh, I think what seems to be a bit of a mi mixed bag, there is, uh, yeah, the, the LGBTQ plus uh, communities. Um, so yeah, that's, those are the four things that I jotted down. I'm keen to hear what, what you are, your experiences and what you would recommend. Because it's only by building allies that we can, I think, really gain momentum. Um, here in New Zealand, uh, we're also, um, uh, I'm a bit in, involved in, in working with uh, Maori communities, so, so indigenous communities. I think that's a, a very, uh, well, it's a, it's a larger uh, marginalized group. Uh, and my experience is, uh, we are extremely well equipped as autistic people to build relationships with other with people from other marginalized groups because we understand all these sort of subtle forms of power dynamics so well. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to you mentioned professional organizations and I think that's a great thing, and I actually um, personally have had an idea um, because. I, as an occupational therapist, I actually struggle uh, to have other occupational therapists come on board um, with a neurodiversity paradigm shift because um, intellectual defensiveness and also they would have to admit that they were participating in practices that could have been harmful to the people that they were working with. So there's a lot of defensiveness around that. However, where I find medical allies, so like in OT world, um, is by going to the people who are not in education, and but going to the people who do physical rehab, or physical therapists, or people who go in and understand the importance of being able to move your body and having the autonomy to make those choices. Um, especially, like, yeah, the rehab, it, it, it's almost like, with professional organizations, you want you want to say, oh, I'm going to go to the people who are most involved in this particular system, and um, that's a hard sell. You go to the people in the organization um, who really don't have a lot to do, but um, with like education, ABA, but can understand humanity and we'll get on board with you. Um, otherwise it's very difficult or it's challenging to address those um, organizations. The, my other favorite, holy mackerel, the students. The students are ready to change the world. If you get those college students, the grad students, oh my God, they're, they're excited and they're ready to go. Um, and so I almost, pardon me, Jake, I almost bypassed the teachers just to get to their students because the they're not um the system hasn't groomed them yet and so if i can get to them before and lay you know just it's just such a obvious you know neurodiversity it's it's a shift that is I really don't think it should take much time for um, people to understand that autistic people are people who um, have human rights. And so I, but yeah, so the students and then the people who don't have something to be defensive about, that's my good allies and organizations. I'm so excited for what you said. I'm excited for the connections it put in my brain because that immediately made me think of my new foray into trying to understand TikTok and how that's a language. Um, and there are, when you think about it, the, the kids are older now. There's kids who experienced ABA who can talk about it. You know, I mean, I don't know if they're like of an age or anything where they could be sharing a story. I don't know how that works out, what that info is like, but you know, there are the youth <laughs> um, and then also the non-defensive, either clinicians, people in the medical field. I think that that made me connect to what Jorn said about the undercover autistics. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh, sorry. Do you want to go now, Jake? I'll be fast because I don't, I don't have a lot to add. Um, you go first, Tara. Okay. Um, so I have found the most amazing allies uh, 
in the black community. They, um, our purposes, I mean, we have to focus more on um, black and indigenous and brown melanated autistic people um, because the, the intersections of dehumanizing and uh, removing culture from people, um, the ABA is, is like a, an extension, a machine of white supremacy. When we really break it down and look at uh, what it what it really is. Um, and so as I've been doing a lot of uh, advocacy for autistic people who have been unjustly prosecuted and sentenced uh, in the criminal justice system. And I've been working with these these orgs. I've learned very much that um, Black Lives Matter, you know, some of the local chapters have been amazing and uh, they have been so supportive of us and to learn our language, the language of disability justice and to fold that into their activism and to really authentically mean it and fight for us. And that has been uh, one source, you know, of reciprocal allyship that, that I have loved. There are uh, restraint and seclusion orgs that want to ban prone restraint. That is not just an autistic thing, but uh, we, we are very much the victims of it, um, more probably than any other demographic. And they have been pretty amazing uh, to work with us. And, you know, we start calling people allies and it's very soon that they, they realize that they have so much in common with us. They're autistic too. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of people that I would like to call allies uh, they're now part of their community because they just realized. But um, there is, uh, there are a lot of teachers uh, and educational groups that I have been working with that have been very, um, it, they don't want to deep dive. They don't want to jump into the deep end. So uh, that is something that I want us to strategize about uh, they, they are afraid to take on the behavior complex because it is so entrenched in everything. And so how mm -hmm. can we help them to separate behaviorism from what they want? Because it's really behaviorism that's ruining that vision they had in their head of what they wanted to do to make a difference in kids' lives. That's why they went into this low-paying career that's not ever going to be financially as rewarding as the amount of investment they put in. But what is making it impossible for them is behaviorism. So I would love to figure out how we can work with uh, them to separate and to show that behaviorism is really what's wrong with everything that's wrong with education. Yep. Sarah, do you have further thoughts on that? Um, Jake? Um, yeah, I will add a couple of thoughts. Um, I wanted um, first just to um, nod to Stacey Easton, who's on this call, um, who's an um, academic and activist here in, in Toronto, who I learn a great deal from. So we're lucky to have Stacey on the call. Um, I wanted to, um, like, I, you know, I really appreciate everything that everyone said, especially pointing to racialized communities as, as um, you know, really good potential allies here. Um, I think, you know, an obvious um, uh, connection um, is, you know, queer and trans movements to ban conversion therapy, which have been successful in, in, in some places. Um, but there are pitfalls that we can see in that history too. And I, 
and I tried to so I've tried to sort of write about that. Um, and there is um, I know on the call um, on the call uh, last week's panel, um, uh, Kim Crawley was talking about you know the, the, the ignorance and the, the, you know, the lack of solidarity, and how frustrating that is. Um, the lack of solidarity among you know queer and trans people who are very happy to have banned one type of conversion therapy, the type that affects them um, if they're not autistic. And um, I agree with Kim. I wanted to add to that though that the you know the context to that lack of solidarity is is important. I think if you want to understand it, you want to change it because it's not necessarily a lack of investment. It's an over investment in not being sick, not being seen as sick or ill, disabled or mad. Um, and that that is um, like the sort of movement to depathologize gay and trans identities is, um, uh, is was a very powerful movement, um, but is sort of studded with all of this um, ableism in it. You know, uh, we're not, you know, dis you know disavowing um, illness and madness and disability, etc. Um, and that is uh, harder to work with. It's not impossible. Like actual queer and trans liberation requires giving up on the attempt to you know, show that we're sane or healthy or, you know, what do these words mean? And it, but in the meantime, queer and trans people benefit a great deal from disassociating ourselves from disability and illness. And that's what we need to work with, I think. Um, a couple of points that I just wanted to add that I think are important in terms of you know things things we did here in the push to ban trans conversion therapies, queer and trans conversion therapies in in my province, is developing alternatives because you could spend a great deal of energy trying to ban ABA and for whatever reason you could not be successful and you still need those alternatives to be pointing parents to parents who come looking for you know supports or advice, um, but you could also succeed in banning ABA and it still leaves a gap in its wake. You know. Um, I think if alternatives become more widespread, um, then those practitioners uh, would hopefully be publishing, they'd be doing research. It begins to change the literature, the sort of body of literature that exists about autism begins to tip, you know, and that has um, I, I think this is why I, I found it so uh, interesting that in the, uh, I think this comes out of the UK, this low arousal approach that there have been uh, research about this, right? It's been published and uh, uh, and it's framed as a teaching approach, an educational framework, right? So it's not a therapy. So it, that I think fits very nicely. We need to say that the alternative can't be a therapy, right? <laughs> it's yeah. a, an yeah. educational That's approach. Great. Great. And, and the educational approach uh, applies as much to the children as it applies to the parents and the people around autistic children. I think that's so important. Yeah, that's great. You know, and, and perhaps some parents need a form of therapy because they are so heavily vested in the culture that uh, their world falls apart if they learn that uh, their child lives in a different world. And I. Yeah. It's because they're probably autistic too. It's so a lot of times when a parent or people find out, like when their cho children are diagnosed as autistic, adults go through that process too. And one of the biggest things is that autistics really like a manual. You know, when we don't know how to do something, we don't like, you know, we want to know how to do it. And so, of course, we're going to be trusting of the medical community. Of course, we're gonna go seek out um, people who are, are gonna tell us, oh, this is what we should do. And I agree with um, the comment that was made that we just need to continue to create um, alternatives so that there's not that gap. But we're, we, I worked in EI forever um, and I love it. I dealt with traumatized parents just to get them to a point where they knew they didn't do something wrong and that their child was perfect and precious and special and we're gonna have a lot of fun. Um, but it was prime, I would say almost six months typically of working with parents. Um, so. And, you know, thank you. I'm really glad you brought that up, Sarah. You know, in the in terms of like the trans health world, there was a big sea change over the past couple, you know, past decade or so to shift from with small kids, you know, trans teens do need things like, uh, or they might need things like puberty blockers, hormones, you know, on the road to medical transition. But with children, these are not relevant. And so there was a big sea change to, you know, in the field to say, 
uh, stop seeing children, actually, like practitioners, therapists, et cetera, start seeing the parents and start saying that when parents call saying, I don't see children, actually, I find, you know, I have a play group where they play with one another. Um, and I find it's the parents that, that need the support um, because you wanna work with parents around things like shame. Um, you know, I think that parents of all kinds of kids who differ in some way from a norm feel ashamed. Okay, but we can work with shame, you know, we know how to do that. Um, I want to add just a couple more things I was just trying to um, say, which was around like, um, so getting like, so developing alternatives, get, you know, getting an alternate alternative set of experts on board. And that's complicated because courting non-autistic experts, of course, has some, uh, some tricky things in it, right? Because sometimes they want to be, then they want, they want to be their show. But anyway, that having another set of professional voices can try, can, can help. Um, I think crafting simple messages helps. And like, Sometimes you lose some nuance when you're trying to like engage public support for something, but really simple, straightforward messages. And I think that the similarity, like amplifying the similarity conversion therapy is one of those messages that where you, where it gets people, they know conversion therapy is bad, you know, get them some, you know, connected to something they know. Um, I think what you're already doing, which is building power, like building power among autistic, in autistic community, I noticed a, a, like a, a small disagreement on the panel last week between Kim Crawley and Laura Dilley that was seemed to me about, about the place of anger in social change work. Um, nobody named it as that, it was just as my observation. Um, and I agree with both of them, that there are like sort of like the very reasonable, respectable voices that are useful in these debates. They help to accomplish things, but to not disappear the place of anger in social change that it really, really matters. Um, and it turns, the, it turns the tide sometimes. And lastly, to plan for backlash. Um, because as you, as you begin to have more of an effect, like as you become more successful against an industry like ABA, where people are very invested and very financially invested, um, I think the power, the power begins to shift. Uh, I, was, I was sued um, for three quarters of a million dollars over an op-ed that I published um, during, during, the, during the shift to, to end conversion therapy in Toronto in particular. Um, and you can imagine that lawsuit changed my life a great deal during that time. Um, and so like I, people who are accustomed, this is my opinion, that people who are accustomed to having power um, and I think ABA therapists would be th those people accustomed to having power over a particular domain, sometimes respond to losing power with rage. Um, and that um, people will laugh as long as they have the power in a scenario, they will laugh at the people who suggest, trans people who suggest you shouldn't treat us this way, autistic people. But when you become su more successful and they begin to see, oh, there's a loss on the horizon here, is they stop laughing. <laughs> and so this means planning ahead. It means understanding very carefully what are the defamation laws in the area that you live in? How, do the, how are those laws interpreted? And watching carefully your public, your public statements, um, making sure everything is very tight and that lawsuits aren't possible, but also your private communications as well. If, you're, if your defamation laws are anything like they are in Canada, it means your private communications are also can be opened up. And lastly, taking time to strategize how you communicate is not the same thing as being silenced. So my experience is if you're sued, you're no longer able to write or speak at all, and that is being silenced. So just to sort of plan ahead for a time when you have more power and when it will matter a great deal, whether you can back up your statements, whether they're true or whether they're inflammatory. Yeah. Um, and this, thank you. This is a wonderful, I think, a closing remark from from you. Uh, I would uh, perhaps want to uh, close from my perspective, just emphasizing that, um, well, we should not, uh, I don't think we are, but really we, we shouldn't worship uh, those people who uh, currently have certain, or, well, give themselves certain powers. Um, in terms of, I think what can shift the dynamic as well is simply to take a trend, highly transdisciplinary uh, approach here because uh, no one um, has a monopoly on, on understanding um, humans and, and uh, you know, human social systems. So uh, actually I, yeah, I, I, I never think 
I, I don't think I've learned much, for example, from the entire so-called discipline of uh, psychology. Um, I found it much more fascinating to uh, dig deep into uh, anthropology and, and other topics uh, to learn about humans. Uh, and it's only if, yeah, what I can also recommend is to connect with people who live in other cultures. Uh, so it's, yeah, locally, this can be indigenous people, uh, as has already been mentioned. Uh, this is very powerful. But then also in other parts of the world, uh, it's not, yeah, the, the cultural norms are different in different places. And uh, the whole conception of what a human is or what society is differs from place to place. So it's, it's dangerous to assume that um, our own culture is the only perspective that exists. Um, now, I'll just let everyone else uh, maybe make some closing remarks for, for this panel. Anyone wants to go? I had a thought about where to start with alternatives to ABA because I know that I know that we have a lot of, and I say we because I, I'm, I'm talking to the educators on the panel, a lot of classroom supports and finesses and ways that we're water and kind of make our way through and support um, around neurodivergent kiddos and students and people. Um, and I'm just thinking like similarly, right? We, we, we know, especially if we want allies that are by POC, right? That we also need to show that we are anti-racist. It's not enough, right? To just be non-racist. And I think similarly, it's not enough to just not want ABA, not that any of us are not doing enough, but we have to be anti any of those practices in everything, right? And so the first alternative to ABA is just having this Hawkeye of just like, how am I a product of these implementations, even if I'm not even aware of it, or how do I have a radical way of mentioning it when I see it? Um, and I think that, you know, we talk about how ABA has fractured a lot of sense of selves. And so it's about rehumanizing, right? Um, and so that kind of was just on a, on a perseverating loop in my head, but I just wanted to shout that out. We are in the act of rehumanizing because when we're talking about banning ABA, we're talking about ending oppression. Um, this is a harmful, maladaptive, reactionary practice that harms people for a very long time. Um, so just in closing remarks, one of the things that uh, I always come to my own experience and my own journey. And I remember um, when I had my son who's autistic, so freaking cute. Um, and I had to make a choice. I had to make a choice if I was going to parent him in a way that was authentic to me and my way of being and what felt right for me, especially as somebody who's autistic and who doesn't believe in hierarchies and doesn't and is so attuned to justice. Um, and I had to make a decision if I was going to parent that way or the way that I was parented. And in the moment that I looked at my child, there was only one answer. That's it. Um, and so I reject the notion that there has that when people are like, oh, it's gonna, you know, it, it can take time in a system, but at a person level, um, I just, uh, if you, it is as simple as saying, I don't agree, I don't consent to dehumanizing another person. Whatever I do, wherever I go, however I interact with this world, I claim own my own integrity regardless of what the system says. Um, and I, that's possible. And especially in gatherings like this, thank you so much for having me and um, everybody who came, the energy is, love it. Thank you. Thank you. Tara. I, uh, I think that my background is gonna be too loud for, uh, but I will try. It, just let me know. Somebody give me a signal if, if you can't understand. But um, I just want to close with saying that uh, I, I feel that panels like this are very important. And I'm happy that, that you have uh, put this together. 
and appreciate it. And um, it, so many important points here that I feel have strengthened my advocacy. So thank you to the panelists. And um, I, I want to kind of uh, trail what Sarah just said as a parent. Uh, my daughter is turning five soon and she just had a developmental pediatrician. Uh, when I spoke to her, the doctor, it was telehealth because pandemic, uh, I wanted to be in a separate room because I don't want to pathologize my child. <laughs> and uh, I was afraid that she would do that in front of my child. And she did uh, recommend four therapies when I said my child is happy, the happiest child I've ever seen and thriving, it, uh, very advanced in a lot of ways academically. But she wanted to put her in four therapies and I told her ABA is abusive. I am diametrically opposed to it. And she said, did you have a bad experience? I said, it's not about an experience. Philosophically, I'm opposed to modifying the natural innate intuitions and needs of a child to work against their own interest, to fit into a world that works against its own interests. So she's already fine. There's no reason for me to change her behavior. And the pediatrician just said to me, well, we'll do three therapies and we can escalate if that doesn't work. Es doesn't work for what? I didn't complain about my child. It is merely her diagnosis that made her believe that my child, and this is a major research university. This is University of Virginia. Uh, it is world renowned. And so um, that is, uh, we have to change this. And I agree with Sarah. We, we have to empower parents to not pathologize and dehumanize their children. And so that is where I will leave off. Thank you very much, Tara. Very nicely said. And um, yeah, thanks again for everyone who's uh, spent uh, the time here with us. Um, I'm looking forward to, to further discussions of this type. So this is, yeah, the second panel, it's one of many. So we're only just getting started with this campaign. We're in this for the long haul. And I'm sure eventually the world will change. Thank you. Take care.